So thanks for joining us today for our workshop, Contextualizing Collections, Introduction to Immersive Annotated 360 Virtual Tours with Adobe Captivate Classic. Um, I'm Francesca Albrezzi, and this is my colleague. Chris Tillman, hi and, everybody. <laughs> and I thought before we get started today, we'll just go over the, the sort of roadmap agenda of what we're gonna cover. Um, so we'll start with, introductions both for myself and Chris and also to get to know you were a fairly small group so we want to make this session informal and practical to you and your needs and what you're what you're thinking of in, in terms of this kind of technology. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of virtual tours just starting off. I'll mention Matterport because it's a great comparative tool um, that also do, does virtual tours and I'll present some work that I've done using Matterport so that if that's of interest we can talk about that too. Um, and then we'll do an overview of recent 360 camera captures that we've done together in collaboration uh, with faculty on campus for documenting um, and for teaching and learning. And so, so you get a sense of how we're using these technologies um, to teach. And that'll lead into really this introduction to Adobe uh, Captivate Classic. And there's two there's two forms of Adobe Captivate. That's why you'll hear me at the, the ending classic to, to this. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences um, between the two and why we're teaching classic today. Um, in terms of that sort of workshop portion of this, we'll go over how to get started, how to install, what you need, what your setup needs to look like, um, how to create a project, uh, how to work with different slides. These stage areas that you use to build out um, Adobe Captivate uh, modules. And we'll talk about a few enhancing interactivities that you can add. There's a lot that you can do with Adobe Captivate, so we'll cover a few today. But if you're interested in others, please let us know and we can do more workshops like this to, to really get into the nitty gritty of some of the other inter interactivity that's available. Um, and then we'll talk about how to publish, how to export, how to get this onto the web. Um, and a few best practices sprinkled in along the way, things to avoid, um, just how to build an effective project in this manner. Um, yeah, that's where we're, that's where we're going. Um, so as promised, we'll start with some introductions um, and to kick things off. So I'm a digital research specialist and manager of our uh, OARC's uh, GIS and visualization team. Um, and really, in my position, I support faculty in their digital research across campus. And I'm currently serving as the acting vice chair for the Digital Humanities program. So if you're interested in DH, I always love to talk about DH. I came out of the program myself, so um, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I occasionally teach there. I'll be teaching a class in the spring on digital curation. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, and I also occasionally teach for my old department, which was World Arts and Culture slash Dance. So I've been at UCLA for a while now. <laughs> Sorry, I did my PhD. Um, I'm a few other hats that I wear. I'm editor in chief at the International Journal of Digital Art History. Uh, I co-chair the Education Committee for the College Art Association. Um, I'm affiliated with arthistoryteachingresources.org and um, part of the UC Women in Tech. Um, group, which so is Joy, who's in the room. Thanks, Joy. <laughs> um, and then my expertise is really in extended reality technologies. And so that's that's what I'm hoping to share with you all today. Um, and what I mean by extended reality technologies is that I'm specifically interested in immersive experiences as offered uh, by technologies such as virtual reality, augmented reality, or 360 photo or video capture. Um, so this is sometimes referred to as extended reality or XR. So here we use those things interchangeably. Um, and what you're seeing here on the screen is um, a lot of my equipment from my makerspace at home. Um, this is the stuff that I use to do this kind of work. Um, it involves things like headsets and drones and LiDAR, mobile LiDAR, um, and obviously 360 cameras, which we have in the room. Um, this is just capturing really as a backup. <laughs> um, and so my personal research interrogates uh, modes of publishing, display, and information capture uh, 
uh, in museums and archives, so really glam settings, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, and my interest in there is that I think these things break from traditional models of um, teaching, learning, um, and I argue that these digital modalities provide distinctly different paradigms and for epistemologies of art and culture um, that offer greater contextual understandings, right? Like I'm very interested in how as embodied people, we experience the world and that's really how we learn about things is, is remember, uh, I think they said the adage is 10% of what you read, 20% of what you hear and like 80 percent of what you experience. So that's why I'm, I'm interested in these tools. Um, and, and why I'm interested in the intersection of them with teaching and learning, which is how I've been uh, collaborating with Chris. All right, so uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Chris Gilman. Um, I'm with the uh, Library Digital Library Program. Uh, I am the Digital Curriculum Program Coordinator. Um, and that's a long title, but it generally involves um, deepening and enhancing uh, engagement with our library digital collections, but also in many ways involves a lot more outreach and things like instructional design um, and technology um, and media integration into courses. Um, I collaborate uh, frequent, frequently with Francesca. We have a lot of common interests and, and overlaps. Um, and um, she's going to be the star of the show today, pretty much, but I'll be here to um, help out. Um, I'll describe pretty much my, my general interest, uh, which is something uh, that I call collections-based uh, learning in the curriculum. And that deals um, with a, a particularly challenging um, uh, matter of integrating uh, glam institution that is galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, collections, typologically finite, uh, similar, typologically similar finite sets of items in the curriculum and puzzling through how you uh, convert those into learning activities for students. So uh, in many ways, my work involves the, um, the kind of uh, intersection between physical and digital collections, um, but also um, how do you convert all of those into um, things that enhance student learning and, and, um, and bring them into archives and museums? So uh, this is very exciting work, um, and you'll see some fruits of our collaborations uh, with, uh, with others on campus. Um, we're really here to talk about virtual tours today. That was the grounding principle. Um, but it, And it's no secret, as evidenced by recent articles like this, that, you know, many sectors are acknowledging that virtual markets are gaining momentum. And so as virtual markets and research grow, virtual tours really do have a lot to offer us. Um, for instance, there's greater contextualization, right? I think that's one thing that both you and I are really interested in. Um, but also things like in terms of research, right? Decreasing travel time and cost. If we can actually offer experiences or um, you know, windows into specific places through these kinds of technologies, it means that we don't necessarily always have to go there um, or go back repeatedly, right? If we have a, a resource of that that we can revisit, it's really useful. Um, it can cut project time by, in, again, increasing access, right? That you, um, again, don't have to spend the time going back to a place over and over. I'm thinking specifically of ex exhibition work, right? If or um, special collections work, right? You can, you can have that uh, encapsulated and revisit it as many times as you need to. Um, it's also just engaging, right? It's, um, it's immersive and these things really make a difference. I'm just gonna show an example here on the screen. Um, this is from one of my, my favorite museums, the Hollow Museum. And you can just see instantly, right, how, I mean, eye-catching something like this is. And it makes you feel like you're there. And you can easily throw this into a headset if you wanted to. And you have annotations that can also have audio, right? So you can create layers 
of interpretation and understanding through interactive virtual tours. Um, and finally, well, maybe not finally, but <laughs> uh, another core thing that we, we have here is that it promotes user-driven uh, navigation and discovery. So it's, it's about presenting a smorgasbord and letting people choose what they want to engage with, right? Um, and then also reducing carbon emissions. Um, you're not hopping on a plane to go visit a collection all the time or go visit a particular site. Um, it reduces foot traffic on that site, particularly if it's an archeological site, right? We wanna protect these and preserve these spaces sometimes. And so having a virtual or digital facsimile of a, of a location can be really beneficial in that way. I did just wanna take a few minutes to talk about a comparative tool um, because it's very popular and you've probably actually seen it in terms of real estate perhaps. Um, but Matterport and Matterport's cameras, um, so their software and their cameras are have become really, really popular. Um, we won't be covering this platform today in detail, but I did want to mention it because and share a little bit about my experience um, with it because I do think it's, again, when you're looking to do this kind of work, it's a major player in the field. And so it's important to acknowledge um, what are your options. Um, so the great thing about something like Matterport is that they have these out of the box tools that make it very straightforward. Um, you can embed photo, video and text quite easily through their platform. Um, it does work with 360 cameras. You don't have to have one of their Matterport cameras in order to create a Matterport tour. You can use a 360 um, camera to, to, and a mobile device. Um, so what you're seeing here uh, in the center is actually the mobile app connected with a 360 camera and all those little individual um, blue marks on the right are where the camera was placed in a capture, a 360 capture. And what it does is it stitches it together to get that thing on the left, which is a, a dollhouse version or a 3D version of the space. So it's a, it's a quite, you know, easy to use tool, which is nice. Um, some of the drawbacks, just to mention, would be things uh, like limited customization, right? You're, you're using their software. So in terms of how it looks and feels, you don't have as much control there, right? Most of that is guided by their software. Um, you do have some things where you can change like colors or things like that, but but in terms of the presentation, right, you're really limited to what they offer you. Um, and it's also subscription-based. So there are fees, you can start account for an account for free, um, but there are fees associated with hosting these types of environments. Um, and so depending on budget, right, uh, and longevity of how long you want something available, um, that may or may not be prohibitive. Um, and in case you haven't seen a Matterport immersive experience, um, I'll just share one with you quickly and, and talk a little bit about my experience with creating one with a 360 camera and then compare that to using the Matterport cameras themselves. Um, I started back in 2015 with this technology and really using 360 cameras to capture performances actually. So, um, very, very similar to what you were mentioning earlier, um, because I felt it offered greater context to the archive um, and was also thinking about, you know, teaching in museums and performance studies and how being able to add that additional level of not just point of view, but all of what was going on in an environment, that that could be really, really useful for the archive. Um, and so this project that you're seeing here um, is one in which I partnered with David Gear, who's the director of UCLA, uh, UCLA's Art and Global Health Center and a professor in world arts and culture slash dance. Um, and he was curating an exhibition at the Fowler Museum on his longtime project uh, through Positive Eyes, which is a program that uh, works with people who are HIV positive uh, to represent themselves and their lived experience through photography and film. Uh, and so I was brought in right before the end of the exhibition, right before it was deinstalled, to uh, in the spring of 2019 to produce this 360 Matterport um, annotated experience. And again, we used a fairly lightweight 
360 camera, so one similar to what's here in the room with us. And it was the Insta360 One X and the, in combination with the Matterport app and quickly moved through the space. It only took us about maybe an hour, hour and a half. Um, and so, you know, every single one of those spherical captures that you're seeing on the floor, those round things are an example of where the camera was set. And so that really dictates where you can move in the space when you're traveling through it. Um, but then we were able to add annotations to all the photographs and all the videos that were in the exhibition, all the, the um, text that went along with it. And what's been so gratifying to hear is I just was catching up with um, Professor Gray last week, is that he's using this in grant proposals to continue to showcase this exhibition elsewhere, right? It's a great way to show people, hey, this is how we did this before. This is how I'm envisioning doing it again. The exhibition traveled too. So he was able to share it with future venues to say, this is how it looked in the, in the Fowler Museum space. This is how we curated it there. Um, and let's talk about how we can translate it for your space. And that in itself is really, really useful. On top of that, it was right before the pandemic. So when it started to move the next location, it actually didn't really get seen. And so he was able to show or use this uh, digital copy as a way to showcase, teach with, um, and continue to share that work with others. Um, so it still fulfilled that mission of a traveling exhibition in many ways. Um, and most recently, I've been working with John, who's in the room um, at the Fowler, to do more Matterport captures um, as part of their Vital Matters project. Um, and so in this digital initiative uh, associated with their grant around engaging with religion, the materiality of religion, we wanted to showcase their exhibitions that they have been um, doing around this topic and, again, annotate them so that these things can last and be used again in classrooms um, repeatedly. And you can see just from what I was showing in the video versus I'm gonna show this example here, right? This is a more recent one with the actual Matterport camera um, that you do get a bit of a better quality when you use their Matterport cameras, but it's not a huge difference, right? So in terms of investment, if you're not worried about lighting, right? These sort of the, the big shiny lights, the, the 360 camera is more than efficient, um, more than enough. With a Matterport camera, you're able to sort of control those things in greater detail. Um, and again, right, the benefit of this type of a, a capture is that you can add things in. You can also just show, show a little bit of how we're um, really layering these types of environments with additional content. So one of the other things that we're doing is creating LIDAR scans of objects. And so we're able to bring that into the environment so that all these things live together and it becomes a layered educational tool that people can make use of. We also have videos in here as well, right? So we're able to think about how do, what, what exactly do we want to annotate in this um, environment and how can we create one space for people to access it? So it depends on which Matterport camera that you have, but yes, they have, they have integrated LiDAR, um, which is fantastic. Um, and it really makes a big difference. It can really make a big difference. Um, John is a regular user. I mean, if you want to talk about a little bit of the difference between the Matterport two and three, I'm sorry to take up too much time. Uh, the Matterport, uh, the one that usually we use is the Matterport uh, two, uh, Pro 2, and that basically is more or less uh, photogrammetry. We just came up with a Matterport Pro 3, and that one is basically fully live on um, but it also has a high-res camera. One of the things that we've noticed is that if we're using an environment that has lots of reflective surfaces, such as the mirror, sometimes the laser the light are basically integrated with the light. So that's one of the reasons why um, we basically have both of them in the arsenal, yeah. just in case. But you know, it's kind of like once you once you use it enough, you're able to look at something and say, okay, that's going to work. That's not going to work. Yeah, excellent. 
the the three the three is better. I mean, if you're if you're looking for, they're both very very accurate. If you're doing a space with a lot of windows or a lot of reflective surfaces, the two is going to be better than the three. Story Maps is a GIS tool, ArcGIS tool, um, but it's really now popular for website building even. Um, and it's been a great resource for the Fowler in thinking about um, building out K through 12 content, really six, six through 12, um, because you're able to automatically have GIS information pull from that. And then we've been creating prompts, we've been building out um, sort of subject matter content. And let me use my mouse. So speaking of collections, right? This is this is the power of something like um, so with story maps, right? We're we're focused on how do we build out um, a lesson plan that makes use of the Marilyn Constant exhibition collection that we had um, that just passed. It's an exhibition that just passed, and so we're able to introduce this artist, use really high uh, end media. We're able to bring in sort of contextual information about geography and hit that learning component as well, embed video, um, and create these sort of scrolling learning experiences. Um, and as part of that, we've embedded these Captivate learning modules. So. We, we wanted to make this more interactive. And so the way that we did that was by embed, embedding these Captivate modules. And we'll showcase a few more of these in a minute, but what's great about something like this, right, is that it's all, all the information's in one place. Students are able to sort of click through, right, get the information, have, have a, a, an experience with the, um, the object itself, and then practice through like a matching activity around vocabulary, right? So thinking about, oh, okay, or, or concepts, right? So thinking about how do I pair these things up? If I get it right, then I get to move on to the next thing, right? If I get it wrong, I submit tells me to try again. So this is the, the benefit of something like Captivate where we're not necessarily using immersive tools here, but we're using interactivity that allows for students to directly engage with the content that they've been reading about, right? Watching. Um, so great question. So that's how we're, we're using story maps. Um, I'm just gonna switch back here to, are there any other questions? Oh. Thank you, Jerry. So uh, Jerry said in the in the chat, fantastic visual mapping, especially for insurance purposes. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> Jerry, you're you're well aware of what's going on right now at the Fowler. The Fowler just uh, one of their exhibitions just got flooded, um, which has been really heartbreaking with the, the recent rain. And so they do have this capture that we did prior to that to be able to offer um, insurance. So that's a, another practical use for this type of technology. Um, so I think what's important to note here is that we're seeing that virtual engagement can increase attendance dramatically as well. So one of the things that I often hear skepticism around this kind of technology is, yeah, but we're, we're out of the pandemic now. We want to be in person. Absolutely. What's great about this, though, is that normally people see it online and then actually want to go experience it, right? It actually makes that in-person experience more appealing. Um, so here's an example from when the University of Southern California partnered with the Pacific Asia Museum to create a Matterport tour of their space. Um, and once the tour launched, they saw a significant increase in their web traffic. Um, but they also saw their physical attendance was boosted from 30 to 40 to over 800 visits. That's, that's a significant jump. Um, and so the museum's director said, was quoted as saying, it, it democratized the exhibition and its messages um, 
opened them up to a broader audience and made our important work much more accessible. So I think in terms of accessibility, right, it really can check boxes there and help people be um, more inclined to show up in person. Okay, so before we dive into the workshop portion, I just want to showcase a few other recent collaborative projects that you can, so that you can get a sense of these technologies um, and how they're being used in research and teaching and learning and documentation and, and preservation. Chris, I'm really going to let you <laughs> turn this over to you now to talk about some of these great things. We also have Chen Ling uh, on the Zoom as well, and a lot of this was spurred um, by by her for her classes, and so. Um, you know, please jump in, Chen Ling, um, to add as well as we sort of describe some of these projects. Uh, so um, I've collaborated with, uh, with Chen Ling, who you can see there, um, Anthony Banyaga um, in the herbarium, um, and, uh, and Francesca, um, and some others, Russell Johnson, who you'll see uh, in, in a minute, um, to, um, to incorporate uh, uh, collections of physical specimens of plants uh, in the herbarium. These are flattened plants, typically in, in folders and shelves. Um, and they related to things that students were studying in historical records, um, old illuminated manuscripts, and other things, but also live specimens uh, in the UCLA Botanical Gardens. Um, and so it was a special experience for students to go into the herbarium and see the physical files and how they all work. Um, they also learned about digital files um, and, they, um, and some very fancy databases. Um, and then took this uh, remarkable tour in the botanical gardens. And, uh, and we brought along 360 cameras for both of those experiences. And largely it's to, um, to have something for students who can't do it or for successive years to record this um, and get a sense of the immersive and tangible experiences that, that students are, are experiencing. And then partly it was experimental to see you know, what works on a 360 camera, what, what parts of education um, uh, uh, kind of come alive in this, in this dynamic uh, setting. And based on that experience, then we, we did a couple more that we'll, uh, we'll take a look at. Um one of the things, I mean, in doing this, these immersive tours, um, we were traveling, in one case, traveling with Anthony through the herbarium. And so the, the 360 tour was actually about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, as long as the class was. Um, so one of the things I experimented with was actually cutting up that footage so that we created these 360 bubbles um, that are, that are the footage from where we stopped along the route and then overlaid the, or added those to a map, sort of dimensional map of the space to try to combine where we were, you know, in a, an overview from a meta perspective with where we stopped and talked about things. Um, and I brought this into Mozilla Hubs as just a test of, okay, if we were to try to share this again uh, or share this digitally um, and document and share where we went and what that, that tour was like, um, could this be a good way to pair the, uh, or give people a sense of the movement through space, right? Um, and so this, this is a prototype of that. Um, and it's an opportunity for people to revisit it later, right? So that if Anthony can't always be there to give these incredible tours that he gives, there's an option, a digital option that people could stop and see the, the main highlights of what that tour is like. Um, and I do want to say that in all these cases where we're filming with students, Chen Ling was um, wonderful in getting student permission to be able to um, put photo releases so that they agreed that they were comfortable being filmed. We didn't do anything without permission from the students um, and that they were able to opt out if they didn't want to be there that day and just watch the recording if they, if they preferred to. Um, most students opted in, which was great, but 
that that was it. I just wanted uh, to note that as well. And then do you maybe want to talk a little bit also about the Digital Tendons project? So speaking of opting out, um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm particularly squeamish um, and uh, have a hard time dealing with uh, the, the inner, the inner uh, world of human anatomy. But I've been working also um, uh, closely with Chen Ling in, in um, designing some uh, learning activities and curriculum around the history of, of anatomy. Um, and um, studying uh, uh, with materials from Russell Johnson's um, uh, materials in, in library special collections, um, such as Vesalius um, uh, or uh, Rembrandt here, the, the um, anatomy lesson of Nicolas Tulp. Um, these are really kind of central cultural um, uh, monuments um, and also um, kind of key pieces in the in the in the history of science, and they revolve around uh, a, um, a a kind of central fixation on on human anatomy. And we started uh, exploring the idea of well, what do they do now? Um, where do uh, where do students learn about anatomy, and how closely related are um, an anatomy labs of the present? Um, uh, related to uh, the experiences and the performances of anatomy lessons in the past. Um, so uh, uh, Chen Ling um, and Francesca and I, along with uh, Doug Daniels in the Lux Lab, reached out to Tony Frisia, um, who uh, heads the anatomy lab, um, to see about kind of getting through the taboo of showing human anatomy uh, both in uh, 360 um, uh, renderings of human body parts and also in the privileged space inside the, uh, the anatomy lab where students actively work. So what we see here um, is, a, is a product of Francesca's uh, work developing one of these interactive tours. And, and I'll, this is developed with um, Adobe Captivate. Um, we did 360 captures, uh, sort of still captures and video captures with the students working in the lab. Um, we received permissions from the Donated Bodies program to do this work. And all of what, what you're seeing is not actually any of the specimens because those will always live behind a, a password protected Adobe Captivate wall. Um, so these things can be used in Chenman's class um, under and learn um, where they're sort of restricted access. But the point was to not inhibit the learning that happens in these spaces, right? And to share that learning um, with those outside of maybe the anatomy core curriculum, but with students that are still interested, whether it's art students who are looking to learn about more about anatomy or history students, in Chen, you know, Chen Ling's case, teaching about the history of anatomy and how it's practiced, right? To actually be able to give them um, a window into that where we can't always we can't always beg on on uh, Anthony to let us in uh, Tony to let us into his uh, his space all the time and so when we can't do that we do have this alternative um, and so we also layered in as you sort of see from this um, small uh, capture of of what that tour is like annotations that introduce the lab and what happens in the lab and what are students doing in the lab and where are the stations, like sort of four stations that are in the lab. Um, so that was um, another example of how we've partnered. And then I think we have one more, which is gonna be the focus for the workshop. Um, so lastly, this is a, a set of 360 captures that we did with Russell Johnson. So this, I think, uh, really demonstrated very well um, some of the possibilities and the challenges of working with digital and physical collections. Um, so I work with Chen Ling particularly on dealing with a digital collection of patent medicine trade cards and integrating them into uh, her courses in Brew and Learn using a lot of advanced um, uh, deep zooming uh, technology. Um, so if, if you can click into it, um, just to see, um, this is extraordinary archival quality um, uh, digital uh, material, 
Um, so on the digital collections uh, interface, you can zoom in and zoom out, rotate, um, flip, and, and see these items. And then using uh, a standard of image delivery, actually draw those things into other contexts, crop and manipulate and so forth. So a lot of hands-on work using a computer. And at the same time, when you zoom in, you get all these details, but you lose track of how big something is or what it looks like or feels like. And that's where the, the, uh, the sort of the ideal pairing uh, uh, comes into play that um, Russell Johnson has not only the digital collections for us to use that he curated, but also the physical collections that he can bring into his classroom uh, environment. So this is, um, Caroline, to get back to your, um, uh, to your interest, this is special collections. And we wanted to see how students in that instructional space responded to the physical objects um, and engaged them after they had looked at them as digital objects. Um, and we also got a chance to capture uh, Russell in instruction. So you can see and rotate around as he is presenting objects in this sort of uniquely individual and, and sort of personal or embodied um, uh, learning experience. And uh, I'm taking you through as uh, uh, Chris was sharing, what an example of a Captivate, the Captivate that we built based on these experiences of, of Chen Link's field trips uh, with her students to, to um, special collections with Russell. And so this is a, um, a video that we were able to just bring in and embed of Russell speaking. Um, um, prior to um, visiting the special collections, they actually viewed this. A little this. version of a talk I gave a, a number of years ago at the Ephemeris Society of America. Um, and and talking about pain. Anyway, so I won't go through all of that, but because we're going to show more clips of of Russell in a minute here. But as you can see, right, I have in this embedded window, which again can be shared in Bruin Learn. It's hosted online. Um, I have opted to just use the in this case the Adobe Captivate um, navigation down here at the bottom as a way to control. It is set to automatically forward um, on some of the slides. That's what you saw earlier, right after six seconds. And we'll, when we get into Adobe Captivate and how it works, it was set to automatically move forward, but you can you have a lot of precise control over how a slide shows up, what the interactivity is and what you can do um, with the elements on that slide. So we'll, we'll talk about that more in a second, but here's, right, Sort of walking. Um, we have over here by group, People and then listed by group, and then what? This is Russell's introduction for the actual activity. So we captured that in 360 and brought it into Adobe Captivate so that people could see how this field trip was organized and run. What card numbers? So the card numbering starts there, comes around over here, goes in this room and then ends there. I'd encourage you to, in addition to your three cards, look at some of the others and get a sense of the scope of what's there. Um, also the variety of sizes from tiny ones to big ones. I'm gonna pause it there because it's a, a 15 minute explanation, but it, it's him setting up the exercise that he and Chen Li planned for the class um, and as we move through this tour, what you can see is we also caught moments of learning where the students were engaging with the cards and Russell showcasing particular aspects of the cards um, to students. So here's, here's a shorter clip of that. Okay, a hold to the light one I think is this one. Yeah. This one here. It's this one and this one as well. Right. Yeah. So did, did you see the effect? Yeah, I did. It's did you see the effect? So that actually, it moved forward on its own. But if you keep watching it, right, it, it shows you how she was looking at the, the card. And you're able to see how that card actually works. And then we jump ahead to 
the actual digital card where you can deep zoom, you can see it up close. And this is pulled directly from the library's website. So this is actually an interactive window. It's bringing in that IIIF um, viewer into the Captivate so that students can directly interact um, and see what they're talking about, which is um, around her eyes, right? Mm -hmm. there, there is actually pinpricks. Can you see even this? Not like they can see Not it, like in, they can see in, it in real life, but if you put it up as the student did, you can see through and it, and it changes what you see in these cards. And not all of them had little tricks like this, but a number of them did, where you could fold them, you could sort of see them. And that, um, and that sense of, of the experience um, is captured in Captivate, as it were. And uh, it, it might invite other people to come in for more of his sessions, or at least be able to follow and get a sense for what happened. Um. And again, just to get a sense of like the size of the cards, right? Being able to see this, the students interacting and looking and they're actually quite small. So when you're interacting with the digital copies, right? You can zoom in, you can see the really closely, but getting a sense of their tactile you know, nature um, is quite important. And then pairing that with also the student work um, that Chen Ling shared, right? Where a student uh, let us share their, their assignment as part of this to see how students were interacting with the cards in the space and thinking about these things um, and working through a lot of the ideas of the class. Um, and then finally, to also think about the end product of the class, which was a scalar project, um, which is an a interactive multimedia, a multimodal publishing platform that can bring in triple IF content, right? All of these things that we were just looking about, the, the deep zooms and all of that allow, uh, allow um, Chen Ling's students to be able to crop and really closely annotate these things and create essays around that work um, and their understandings of the collection. Okay? Um, and this is all interactively embedded so you can actually sort of explore that website directly here in Captivate. So that's an example of the Captivate that we're building. And so with that, I thought I'd jump into sort of how you actually build some of these things, because um, I know we've got about a half hour left. Um, is there anything, though, that we should add before? Um, I, I would just add w one more thing, which you could, you could see, and that is that there is so much media within media within media, and um, uh, these systems in that way are compatible. Um, having a course, providing materials, but also telling the story of what the course is and what some of the student work products are, it, it's a very infectious way to spread good ideas about teaching and learning, for example, um, for people to just see what's possible. And sometimes when you do things that are very digitally heavy, you have a harder time expressing, like, what was the magic of the moment? When something was happening, um, and you know, there are other examples uh, that um, we've uh, experienced together uh, that we can talk about, perhaps in, in question, about um, uh, how exciting it was and how well um, some of these um, these approaches have done to capture that, um, and just just so people kind of understand. Think we shouldn't take that magic for granted right in terms of the learning experience that's that's one of the benefits of bringing these tools in um uh and so this is again i'm i'm going to showcase what i can uh today of this tool and if there's interest in exploring more i'm happy to to go deeper in another workshop um but i just want to start with a brief overview so adobe captivate classic is a is a powerful e-learning um, authoring tool, as you've seen, right, that allows users to create this interactive and engaging e-learning content. Um, it's been a leading software in the industry for a little while now. You probably have seen a version of this if you've ever had to do a training, right, where you click through slides um, interactively. That's, uh, it's often Adobe Captivate behind these things. Um, but it allow, allows for this sort of dynamic and media-rich learning 
modules to be created. Um, Classic came out in 2019. And so this is an older, uh, this particular version is an older version of the um, tool. A new version came out in 2023, um, but that new version doesn't actually have the 360 features. They took that out for the new version. So uh, it's why we're focusing on the classic and it's why they also have continued to support the classic as they launched the, the 2023 version as well, because they know that some people are still using those 360 tools from the classic. Um, and so really classic offers a range of features such as responsive design, interactive elements, um, robust multimedia integration, um, and it, it makes it an ideal choice for creating immersive learning experiences. Um, so again, before we delve into detail, I just wanna um, help us understand how to get started with this, um, this, this particular software. So in terms of system requirements, right, it operates both Windows and um, Mac OS platforms. Uh, it, you can um, make sure that your system meets the necessary hardware and software requirements for optimal performance. This is a heavier use tool. Also, if you're working with 360, if you've ever worked with 360 files, they're big. Right? So to keep that in mind, you have to have this piece um, to, to be able to do that. The installation process, though, is fairly straightforward, right? It's um, you download the software from um, the Adobe website and follow the instructions provided for the installation. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, it's not part of the UCLA cloud bundle that we have access to. That's one of the bummers. Um, it's currently, I think, offered for $33, $34 a month um, in terms of a subscription fee, but you can get, a, I think, a free 30-day trial still. So if you do want to just sort of test it out and see if you like it, um, see if it'll work for your project ideas, take advantage of that. Um, and I will say that the subscription does include both basic or both the classic and the latest version. So you, you do have access to both with that, that subscription. Um, and then finally, in terms of like the user interface, you can see here, and as you'll, as we get into it, it's fairly user-friendly. It's a, a little old school in terms of the design, I think, but it, it does organize things pretty straightforward. If you've ever worked with, um, any kind of Adobe products or offering tools, um, it, it is quite intuitive. Um, and a lot of aspects of the tool are very WYSIWYG. So what you see is what you get. Um, so that's a, that is a benefit, um, but we'll go over more of that in a minute. Um, and just a note as we begin, I'm gonna be trying to <laughs> go back and forth between Captivate and these sort of prefab slides. Um, I think I'm going to try to do as much as I can preloaded here and then switch over to Captivate and stay on Captivate. Um, one thing I will note is that Captivate likes to shut down if you're not playing with it. <laughs> so I may have to log back in. We may have to pause before I log back in. Um, but it, it's, a, it's just one of those finicky things about the tool. Um, but first things first, right, when you log in, you'll be invited to, you'll see this, this window, right, and you'll be invited if you have recent projects, they'll, they'll be there. Um, you'll have new, which will allow you to start a new kind of project. Um, there's six, six different options for new projects and I, I'm not gonna go through all of them today, um, but I will say that you can bring in PowerPoint slides um, and add interactivity to them. So if you've already spent time building things out in PowerPoint and then you just wanna add some of the features of Adobe Captivate into them, this is a great, that you're able to do that, it's very easy. Um, what we'll focus on today is the VR project and the blank project. Um, and what I wanna point out here is that you may sort of intuitively think, oh, if I have 360 material, I should start with the VR project. Um, if you do, then you're, you're locked into only using those 360 slides um, throughout. If you choose blank, you can then add some slides that are 360 and some slides that aren't. Um, so that's what I tend to use is start with a blank and then go from there, unless you're thinking that the whole project is going to be a VR project, right? Then you may opt for the VR um, option. Um, and I will just mention they also have a resource tab, which is really useful, um, particularly if you're new to the tool and you want to 
see things out there, right? I would, I would uh, encourage you to investigate these resources because what you're gonna do is you're gonna see things that are, see different kinds of functionality, and then you can copy that functionality into your own presentation pretty easily. Um, they allow you to, to be able to look at how other people have built out projects and sort of bring those into your own very quickly. To create a new project, it's quite straightforward, right? The, only, the one thing that I would mention about creating a new project, right, or starting with a blank project is that it will prompt you to think about, or you, um, you will wanna think about prior to, to um, starting one, what, custom, what format you want this to be in. As you saw from my window earlier, right, it, this window is designed a specific setting, right? And so if you're thinking of this is gonna be on mobile or it's gonna be on an iPad or that sort of thing, you can actually control those dimensions um, when you start the project. And it's a little more difficult to go back and do that later on um, and sort of retrofit the project. So try to decide that up front. That's one thing I, I would mention. Um, also, right, in terms of getting started, um, it allows you, Adobe Captivate Classic allows you to configure various project settings, um, including themes. So you can set those out. There's master slides um, and there's sort of other project specific settings that, that you'll want to pay attention to. And we'll go through this in, in a second. So in this interface, you'll see that you'll start with, um, when you start with a big project, it'll look a lot like PowerPoint, right? You'll have that sort of main um, slide in the center. You'll have the various slides that you're going to build out here. You can add slides using this plus feature up at the top, and we'll go through that. And also think about the sort of themes of the slide, right? You can change them here very quickly in that drop down. And then we have a menu across the top that's the features, the multimedia features that you can add. So adding text like you would in a normal slide, adding shapes as you would in a normal slide. Like this is all very um, presentation. Uh, basic. What's different would be things like objects, interactions, um, and some of the media, right, that these things are, uh, is where the interactivity starts to happen. Um, and we're going to, again, go into those more in a minute. Um, and then I'll mention the panel on the right of your screen. This is where you deal with properties and timing. So timing is actually a really important component, obviously, if you're building out something that's interactive. When do you want an annotation to show up? When do you want to move to the next slide? What should a button do? When should it do it, right? That all happens in this panel on the right side. And this panel will adjust based on the type of media that you're clicked on in your, in your um, project. So I'll showcase that again in a minute um, when we do all of it live. Um, understanding how to work with slides is obviously essential for, for making this kind of learning content. So I do want to just mention quickly, what are the different slide content? Um, the ones that we'll be focusing really on today are blank slides or content slides, um, the 360 slide um, and PowerPoint slides. So those are the things that you can bring in quite quickly, but you do see you have all these options uh, of the kind of slides that you can bring in. Uh, also, in terms of, again, the properties, there is an asset library and themes that you can choose from, so you don't always have to develop the design from scratch, right? You can make use of things that are already out there in their libraries, um, and so tap into that as, as you'd like. So here's where I'm going to start to switch over, I think, to, to Captivate and bringing that up on the screen for us. Um, but, but actually, before I do, I want to say it's best to prep your media in advance. So when I was working with Chen Ling and with Chris, we thought about what exactly we wanted to bring into this experience and how did we want people to, to interact with it. Um, and so we actually created, I'm going to, sh I've shared these in my slides for today. And, and if anybody does want access to my slides, I'm happy to share them. Just um, send me a message and, or, or I'll, um, after the class, send, send them out the email um, that has links to all of these things. But this is the content sketch that we created for both um, sort of the anatomy lesson, um, 
when we went to see Russell um, in, in special collections, as well as for the patent medicine trade parts. And we really thought through, okay, what, how do we introduce things? What's on the first slide? What's on the second slide? We brought the media together. And then in terms of the 360 content for the interaction, if you click on something, right, there's, there's limited options to what that annotation can do. And I'll show that in a second. So I actually ended up splitting these clips up. And so I needed to know in advance where did the annotation need to land and what needed to happen when you clicked on that annotation and what information did it need to bring up and then where do we need to be brought back to once we were done with that annotation right so you have to really think through that roadmap in advance um, it'll make your life so much easier if you do um, so that's that's one really important part here um, i am going to bring up captivate now so that you actually start to see what these things are. So in Adobe Classic, right, we can start with recent projects, you can start with new, right, or these resources. Um, for the purposes, since we're running low on time, I'm just going to jump into a project that was already built so that you can see sort of what this looks like. Um, so let's do the anatomy lesson because that actually has annotations um, in the 360. So here, and one thing I, I didn't mention in terms of the, um, the layout is that you also have this timeline bar on the bottom. And this is where you're able to manage the media that you're bringing in on each one of the pages and set a time frame for everything. So everything is timed out. Everything has a level of time um, associated with it. You can, um, again, in properties, control that from over here. Um, and you can also extend it out directly by clicking into these elements, right? And extending them along the, the bottom, right? To make them longer or shorter. Um, I think I have it locked right now, which is why it's not doing that. But each one of these elements you can see as I select, right? It reselects down here. Um, and so that allows, again, as I shift between elements, this panel on the right shifts too. So I have different controls that I can access. I can control the um, actions, I control the options and the timing um, up here with the properties and with the timing. Um, for example, if I brought in, so this is an example of a, uh, a media slide. So here in the asset library, I'll just point this out really quickly. Um, you can bring in, this is where you can download and bring in sort of 360 assets that are already built in, images, videos, audios, and buttons, pre-made buttons, which is really great. Um, in this case, what I've done is I've built slides, and I will say under PowerPoint, right, here's where if I've built out a slide already and I want to reuse a slide, I can very easily pick from there, right? So you don't have to reinvent things every single time. Um, it's quite easy to, to then bring in things that you've already created um, and not have to, to reinvent it every single time. In this case, um, so I have an image, what you see here is an image that I've brought in um, using the media feature, right? I can bring in image, audio, video, bring in animations, um, HTML5 animations, right? SVGs, bring a lot of different stuff in just through the media. Um, here's an example of, this actually is a shape component, right? So I created a background using a shape component, brought in video, um, and added a text header. Um, one thing I'll talk about here just very quickly in the interest of time, I know I'm rushing here, but um, you can, they have preset, uh, I think if I can see it from here, I think that's where it is. They have preset um, uh, things like titles, captions, all of that that you can select from. So then when you're moving through your project, everything can be uniform. Right, you can just use the preset um, and you can style those presets so they come back the same every single time um, as you're building out. 
one thing that I, I find also very easy to pack um, is that sometimes if you're, if you're familiar with designing things outside of Captivate and you just want to have that freedom, um, right? There's limited features in here to design. Design it elsewhere, then bring it in as an image, right? And then layer it in content. That's what I've done here, right? Is that I've, I've built this out in a different platform, saved it out as an image and layered it in, added some shadow to give it dimensionality. Um, and so that's, that's how I handled that there. In terms of 360, right, this is an example of me bringing in 360 video and adding an annotation. So again, this is a slide where you just, you add a 360 slide. It says to add the video, right? It asks you where you need to import it from, right? And I can find one of my 360 videos in here and bring it in. I'm not gonna do that just for, for time's sake, but that's, it's quite straightforward. Once you've brought it in, again, I'm gonna delete this slide just so that it doesn't. Um, um, mess with, with how we've set this up, right? Which is here, one of the key components that I wanna point out in terms of interactivity, right? There's two interactivities that I wanted to showcase today. One is the hotspot for these annotation features, and then the other is sort of matching. Um, so here were buttons, essentially. So here, again, they operate very similarly. A hotspot is brought in on top of the 360. I imported the 360 video here, which you see down below, right? And that time, bar shows you how long it is, right? And along that play line, I've added a hotspot. And I've selected where, at what point in the video I want that hotspot to show up. Um, and when it does, right, so here is, you can, you have preset hotspots that you can choose from, which is really nice. Um, or you can add an image as well. Um, I'm just going to quickly sort of show you, right, if I bring in this, it does curve with the surface because of the curves nature of 360 video, so you want to keep that in mind. Um, when you add it to something, right, like that one, and right, I'm just deleting that particular media from down here, you can also click and, and delete them from here. You do want to set up the view that you want, and then you want to look at sort of timing and properties for these things. Um, in this case, right, I want to think about where does this go? Um, what does it do when you click on it? So I'm able to actually select from a drop down what should happen, what's the action when you click on this particular thing. Um, in this case, I want it to go to the next slide, right? I want people to, to see it come up and I want people to, to click on it and then be brought to new information. Um, I could just have text show up, right? So it could just be an immediate oh, pop up, read something and then move on. Um, but in this case, we wanted to do something a little more uh, heavy. And so what we did was you click on it, you go to the next slide and you're presented with the 3D version of what he's showing on the table. So students can actually interact with that. And this is brought in via a link. Um, so one of the other interactive elements that you can use, um, right, when we talk about um, the things that you can bring in, right, you can bring in interactive videos, you can bring in objects, and one object is from the web. So embedding is really easy um, particularly when it comes to things like Sketchfab, right? You can bring in an interactive media or a website window really quickly into your content, scaffold it with whatever you need to around it, and then let students just interact with it there and then move on to the next thing in the lesson. Um, so we found that to be very useful. Uh, once they are done with that, right, here's one of the, the other buttons, which is next. And again, here it's, I can set 
what I want that action to be. But you'll see you have all different kinds of things that you can, you can style that button differently. You can create different kinds of actions. Um, and then you can also write, you have options of how to control what that thing actually looks like. Um, so again, you do have levels of customization that you can get into. Um, and I'll show you a, a greater, greater customized, we'll go back to that example from the story map and show you how um, Jonathan and I worked together to create a really customized version of this um, for, for the Fowler. Um, and here's again, another example of being able to just bring in from the web, right? And these text captions just live on top like text boxes. If you're thinking of just going from one environment to the next, then I would use a 360 all the way through, annotate that. So every time you're jumping, any annotation is either coming up directly in that 360 or moving to the next. And that would be something that's more of a candidate for being used directly in a headset, right? At that point, that's something that's gonna work, work well and it can be exported in that way so that you can use it that in that fashion. Um, these are, are thinking more with pedagogies, you know, directly learning in classrooms. Um, how do you marry uh, contextual information and other resources in with that immersive being able to interact? A great thing of being able to, to um, finish these things is as you're working through, right, you can preview. Um, so you can sort of export locally and see it in your browser. So as I'm building these things out and to check how I'm doing, uh, let me just go back here. Right, I can immediately export to localhost browser and test out like how something is looking and play that. Um, so that's, that's one way we preview and then we can publish, right? And so these things get published out as packages either directly to your computer. You can also use Adobe Connect. So if you have other Adobe projects that you're using, for example, if one of them bring it into Adobe Arrow or, or one of their other um, toolkits, right, to make it headset friendly, that would be the way to do it. Um, and then you can also publish it right to their learning manager. So they actually have their own sort of platform specifically for Cal. Yeah, I would say that's um, one of the key things to, to think about when you're building out these kind of um, experiences and you're bringing in 360 materials is that these things do get heavy and they do require a lot of storage. So if you're then uploading it to a web server, right, you need to have enough storage on that web server to be able to host really big files. Um, so that's, that's one of the other multi-rich projects then require lots of storage space, um, especially for servers. So, so do keep that in mind. Um, I'm sort of rushing us to the finish line here because I know we're running low on time and I wanna give, if there's other questions too in, in Zoom, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, I'll just mention in terms of enhanced activity, interactivity, right? There, there are a lot of other things that you can do. Um, in terms of this sort of learning interactivity, right? Multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank. Like all of this is actually possible with Adobe Captivate. And again, you have to have space for some of these things, right? But um, it, it, is, it is possible. One example that we saw earlier, right? Was this matching. And really that happens through uh, building out buttons and then uh, bringing in, you know, I, I showed you how to bring in web component stuff before. But here, what you're seeing on the screen is you have the for each one of the objects, right? You're going to set a different state and what it should do, and so you have to you have to um, add that here at the bottom, right? Where the where it's active and where it's inactive, so it becomes quite tedious to build this out for multiple different exercises. I mean, you really have to think through the logic of how these things will work. But this is a what's known as a drag and drop interaction. So that's how you build out that interactivity and you create a moment where, okay, if it, if it reaches this state, then it's, then this correct graphic comes up. If it's this other state, then it's an incorrect graphic um, or a try again graphic, right? So that's how that, and you build it out for each one of the slides. So it does take some time, but it does mean that 
you know, at the end, you have that thing that you're able to click through. Um, this is just an example, again, of this preview publish. When, when you publish, you can bring, you get a zip file that comes out that downloads into the an Adobe Captivate photo um, or do, Adobe Captivate, Captivate folder, and you're able to bring that zip file onto a server, um, extract it, and then host it. Um, so these things are, are easily hostable as long as you have enough space on your server to do it. Um, and so again, the sort of common pitfalls are really paying attention to your, your file size, um, considering you know, whether you'd rather customize outside or directly in Captivate. Um, and then as you saw me having to log in earlier, it likes to shut down on its own. So <laughs> just keeping that in mind, you're gonna have to log back in. Um, so that's, that's really it for us today. Any other questions? Uh, well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.